April the 2nd, 1982. Argentine Navy cameramen film their invasion of the Falkland Islands. Frogmen landed first from a submarine, followed later by the main assault force. Now, the, the situation, as you might hear, is that the radio station has now been um, taken over. If you, if you take the gun out of my back, I'm going to transmit it to you. But I'm not speaking with a gun in my back. By 7 a.m., after fierce fighting, Government House was completely surrounded. In London, there were rowdy scenes in Parliament, swiftly followed by resignations. The government turned to the armed forces. Brian, how are you, Royal? Uh, fine, thank you, Chris. You keeping well? Yes. Yes. Overworked and underpaid. Is, is that the expression? But, it is. But always uh, always in paradise and uh, grateful for what I've got. And none more so than today because I get to chat to one of my wonderful brothers on the podcast that that I created to do just such a thing. So... Welcome, mate. It's it's great to see you. Yes, yeah, smashing. Thanks for the invitation. Yes. So, um, I hold a, I won't say too much details, but I hold an event every year, and we we don't get hold of a Royal Marines bandsman because I found out it's much easier to go to the cadets. So the the band cadets. And they send us, well, I say they send us, Tim's, a, Tim's a, 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 friend, a good friend of mine now. So Tim comes along and he plays the last post for us and they're all immaculate in their, in their blues. And it's the most um, emotional part of the day is what I'm trying to say. It's probably the most important part of the day when everyone just shuts up for a couple of minutes and we um, we listen to the last post and then we we have a minute silent and remember our oppos that are, are no longer here. And uh, you did this job for a living, Brian. Yeah, yeah I was in the, uh, the Royal Marine Band Service for 17 years. Wow. So I didn't play the bugle. I did... Did want to join as a bugler, but when I got to deal for the audition, one of the things you have to do is see the dentist. And they took one last look at these and said, there's no way you're going to play a blowing instrument. So instead of being a bugler, uh, do you want to be a percussionist, which still means playing drums, but I didn't have a bugle to clean. So that kind of suited me and set me off on a slightly different route within the band service. Yeah, It's funny. Um, I think our brothers and sisters in the army or... Make not so much sisters, if I was honest, but they all say, Chris, you're in the Royal Marines. What instrument did you play, right? And they say it as if that's some sort of, um, um, some sort of dig. And my response is, like, I wasn't smart enough to play an instrument. I was a thick boot neck. I'd love to have been smart enough to play an instrument. Do you think I would have joined the corps? Do you, you know, do you think I would have joined joined as a as a grunt? <laughs> um, so massive credit to you. And I I struggled, Brian, to teach myself guitar later on in life. Um, learned a bit of keyboard. Just I don't know. I had a goal that I'd learn guitar as long as I could play one song and sing it in public. That would be my job done, and I did that. Funny enough, in um, in uh, Krakow of all of all of all places, I, w I won't bore people with the story. So yes, I'm I'm full of respect for anyone that that plays an instrument. I'm full of respect for the Royal Marines Band, not just because they're as the deal bombing shows they're in the thick of it just as much as 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 we were, but also during active service, so during combat, 
again, you guys have to go in as as, and I'm sure you're gonna you know feel free to correct me on this one, either now or when we get to it. But as stretcher bearers, first aiders, um, so a, a crucial crucial cog in the wheel. But let's go back to these notes you very kindly sent me. Your dad was in 4-2 Commando. Yeah, he was uh, in 4-2 Commando. He was killed at Suez, unfortunately, uh, three months before I was born. So I never knew him. And, uh, of course, that must have been uh, quite traumatic for my mother. So uh, when I was born, I was named after him and then spent my childhood with a kind of bent towards the Royal Marines, uh, but also playing drums. Uh, so I used to go to Sternos Barracks and uh, have a go on the drums down there and the cadets. Uh, and uh, eventually, after quite a, not the best of childhoods with a, a, a drunken stepfather, uh, at 15 and a half, I went to the careers office and asked to join the Royal Marines. And I guess the uh, recruiting sergeant had a, um, had a quota to fill and he said, oh, you play the drums then. Why don't you think about the band? So, uh, yeah, as I say, they sent me to deal with, with the view to being a bugler. And I ended up being a percussionist, which means you get to play all sorts of banging instruments, but um, no bugle. So, uh, and uh, it did me well for 17 years. Yeah, it did. I really enjoyed my time in the band service. Um, uh, some great drafts, uh, mostly in the Plymouth area, and uh, ended up at Deal as a sergeant, as the percussion instructor. Uh, instructor teaching drums. Yes, and for our friends at home, so we should point out, Royal Marines Band, the best military band in the world, and please don't argue with me because I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you the truth. You're preaching to the converted, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, just absolutely uh, brilliant, can we say, on ceremonial occasions. So the one that... that when they first come into your life is when you pass out of training and the band rock up in all their splendid tree and um, they seem to have a, a, a penchant, if that's the right word, or a penchant for e exotic animals because there's a few of them draped in tigers and zebras and stuff. <laughs> but uh, it's pretty magnificent you've got all your family there they've come for the you know to see their little boy grow up um you've smashed out that green berry and 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 that's no no mean feat in itself and when you march on to that parade square and um brian's going to correct me on all the terminology here but the, i don't know if it's the drum major who goes <laughs> And that's all you hear for a split second. And then the band smash into Thunderbirds. And the next thing your parents see is you marching around the corner of the drill shed in all your in your in your blues, which is another thing the Royal Marines do uh, <laughs> do for the best. It's um it's incredible. And then of course you've got um events like the royal tournament which i i believe that's no no more now that's finished yeah, yeah. That's... and um and obviously bidding people off to war as as they did in the um falklands conflict when the ships were pulling away from from the docks in in, in portsmouth and also southampton and also should give a massive shout out here to the to the Paris band um, because I I've included some of their footage in one of my videos also um, also world class. So Brian, have I said enough? Said too much. Some of it right, some of it wrong. Um, let's talk about the uh, the, <laughs> the animal skins in the Royal Marines. Uh, the bass drummer. And the tenor drummers, of which I was one, were tiger and leopard skins. Uh, they used to be uh, originals. Uh, and in fact, one of the ones I wore was shot by um, Lord Mike Batten in the 1930s. But now, as they've uh, deteriorated over the years, they now use synthetic. 
go they don't go uh, killing animals for that. There were no zebras. Let me get that clear, Chris. No zebra skins were harmed or used in the making of the uh, of the robbery. Know, uh, you don't half know how to spoil a good dip, mate. Come on. And the um, the green address the issue of the green berry. You mentioned that when I was in in the Royal Marines from seventy three to ninety one. We wore green berries because at the time, green berries were issued to all ranks who completed their, their, their junior training, and that included the band mm. So we did military training, but we never did the commando, the proper commando course down at Lips. Uh, in modern times, and I think this is right, um, now the, the, the band surfs have gone back to wearing blueberries because the Royal Marines, when you see the nods, what they go through at CTC to earn their green berry, it's only right. And it's been recognised since about 96 that they really earned that. And so to just dish them out willy-nilly to, to people who haven't done the course was deemed wrong. So from, from about 96 onwards, the band service have reverted to wearing uh, blueberries, like the Second World War Marines used to on ships. So just a couple of corrections there. No zebras, plenty of leopards, a couple of tigers, and green lids for the period I was in, but not since. Yes, and of course that's that's a classic situation in life where there's always going to be two different arguments, and, and neither is right. As far as as far as I was concerned, as a commando, you guys thoroughly deserved a green beret for your for your for for, for what you'd achieved, and yet the guys stood next to me will say no, they don't, and I'm not going to argue with him. And what's the point? It, it's that that sometimes there's. There's not always one one way to view things, are there? But um, yes, it's uh, it's just a very proud thing, isn't it, in the Marines that we've got the Royal Marines Band. It's 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 just the way that it is. The, the Marine Band Service is the public face, really, of the of the Corps, and we do have, we do share the same cap badge. So um, there is very much um, a respect both ways. I think when I joined at Deal, um, then Junior Marines also joined at Deal. This is 1973. And in one long accommodation block, you had the, uh, the Junior Marines at one end in C-Wing and um, the, the Marines uh, the Land Service at the other in M-Wing. And there was very much a them and us attitude because they were being beasted. We did our basic military training, but they were being beasted every day, become Royal Marines. And by, by week four, they saw us junior musicians marching off on our instrument cases to practice music in the afternoons at the School of Music at East Barracks. So I think for Marines of a certain era who joined at Deal around that time, there was very much a them and us. They're proud to have the band there. And when, when you hear the band play that first time on parade, um, your hairs go up on the back of your neck and you, and you grow two inches. But I think for, for that part, it, there's a separation. For me, what brought it all back together was after the Falklands when those young Marines who are now corporals and sergeants saw what the band service could do in a military environment and uh, that brought everyone back together. From So post-Falklands, so from personal experience, uh, we were very much all as one again and everywhere you went, it was, hello, Bandy, let's get you a beer or I remember you on the Canberra or a uh, great job you did there. So, yeah, I think there was a diversion and probably rightly so because of circumstances and it all came back together when the full value of the band service, the music and the military was drawn together um, uh, during the Falklands. So what sort of military training did, did you get? So initially it's, um, uh, it's, the, it's the marching stuff on the parade ground. You don't touch your instruments for about four weeks. And um, you get to handle weapons down at Kings. It was Kings Down down here at Deal. Um, and in fact, but during, during my training, um, I won something called the Houghton Cup, which was uh, the junior Marines and junior musicians had a, a shoot off and I won it. And uh, I'm rather embarrassed to say this, but what happened was normally when you're on a range, as you know, uh, if you, as, a, as, a, as a junior, if you have a stoppage, you put your hand up and some uh, um, hairy corporal comes along and fixes the stoppage. But during the competition, I had this uh, stoppage, put my hand up and he just said, fucking fix it, Royal. So I had to change the magazine on SLR, clear the stoppage, and then I had 20 seconds to finish 
firing uh, 20 rounds. So I just blatted them off. And somehow I got something right, <laughs> beat all these young junior Marines and got my name on a trophy. So a bit of a cheat or a, a good firing position, I don't know what you say, but um, so all those uh, junior Marines in, uh, who were in April 73, sorry, I took your trophy. Get over it. The um, if you do a bit of a uh, night nav exit, get lost on Dartmoor and uh, on, on, uh, in the woods here. Um, so basically, five weeks of, of military training to get you up to speed, and then when you get to a band, eventually you do one or two weeks a year, which depending on which band you're in decides what role, uh, what training you would get. It would always involve um, some shooting and stuff. But again, when I was in, in 73, um, in, in the 80s, uh, the, the perceived threat was the Russian hordes across uh, the German plains. And so we were notionally attached to medical squadron. And our job then was to actually um, decontaminate bodies from nuclear or NBCD contaminants with full of earth uh, so the doctors could operate on them. So that was the the, the core of our military training once once in the 80s and early 90s when that was the perception. Of course, full as earth is that magic powder that um, where you can treat anything with and uh, but that was our job, to, to give everyone a good dosing of full as earth so that the doctors in the med squadron could, could deal with them. Got you. And your first posting, Brian? Yeah, I had a couple of weeks at CTC, uh, kicking my heels around whilst uh, my, my, my first posting was um, HMS Ark Royal. Uh, and it wasn't the one of the Falklands era. This is the uh, the one of the Sailor TV programme. I'm, I'm in that somewhere, if you look. Um, we had, with proper uh, Phantoms, Buccaneers, Gannets. And I joined her in January of 76, uh, uh, and I was aged uh, 19. And we went to America for six months during their bicentennial. And six months later, I was 32 years old, it seemed. You could not do a thing wrong. There was nothing. You couldn't go ashore in uniform and pay for anything. Um, it was just a golden time to be in the States on an aircraft carrier. And being only, uh, we were the only, there was 20 of us in the, in the band on Ark Royal. Uh, 2,700 Matlows and uh, 20 in the band. So uh, it was a good time. How long did you spend on ship? What, how long was I, that draft? 18 months uh, yeah. for me. And then I was replaced by a, a Plymouth rating called Rasher Bacon. And uh, he's, he was a proper janitor too. He said, right, Brian, he says, I'm going on Ark. You, you're staying in Guz. <laughs> he says, uh, and you'll be playing with my brother, Will. He's a guitarist. So not only did we stop drafts, I got a lot of uh, city gigs around Plymouth area on the back of it as well. Yeah, so we've shared a similar experience, Brian, because I was on on the sister ship of the newer Ark Royal. So I was on Invincible. And um, I think the first place we sailed was Germany, but then after that we sailed to Norfolk, Virginia, which I'm guessing is where you, you, you guys rocked up. One of the places, yeah. How how big are their aircraft carriers? Well, uh, the Ark Royal I was on was fifty seven thousand tons, and it, it felt huge. Um, but compared to the Nimitz, where, there's a couple of pictures of us next to the Nimitz. They're probably twice the size of ours. And uh, during during while we were operating out of uh, Norfolk, Virginia, they did cross decking with the Americans because they had similar planes at the time, Phantoms. And of course, our pilots uh, are used to landing on a postage stamp. And suddenly they've got an envelope. And the other way around, the Yanks trying to land on the relatively small Ark Royal. So the goofing deck, as it was called, was full of people watching the Yanks trying to get down onto our carrier. Most of them did it. But, uh, yeah, it must have been uh, half a grand sixpence time for most of them. Are we talking landing on the carrier or cross-decking as in, um, as in the zip line? No, uh, landing, taking their aircraft off the giant Nimitz and trying to get them down onto our Royal, and vice versa. They'd be just as crap as that as, that, as they are when they rock up here and, they, and they've and they never seen a country lane before. <laughs> no no <laughs> offence to our American brothers and sisters, but um, if, if you see the roads that we grow up driving down, you, 
they're not they're not the super highways that you you um you hear in the bloody rocky theme track sung about <laughs> so um yeah we did um we did cross decking of the the um the winch line thing in me bob all the all the matlows could you put below please what it's actually called it's got there's there's a name for it it's called the Boson's chair, isn't it? Boson's seat. There you go. Okay, so all the matlows put another name for it. <laughs> so we sent um we sent Pin, God rest his soul, across to the to a Dutch vessel. And um it's quite funny really. He went across obviously in true uh true bootneck uniform dressed in stockings and suspenders and they sent this gorgeous girl back because they like us the Dutch Navy had started to take women on board and um, the funny thing was the Dutch Navy wanted they want they wanted their rating back which is quite understandable we didn't want Pinhead to come back <laughs> We wanted her to stay. <laughs> Sounded like a first what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Penny. For anyone watching that remem remembers Steve, yeah, absolutely cracking guy, and uh, got run out, fell off a motorbike in London, got run over by a truck, and uh, God, that was a funeral that I don't think anybody could just ever forget. It's awful absolutely awful mm -hmm. so yes so how how was um what was your favorite <coughs> other than the states did you have another favorite um pulling into shore or docking uh, well when we did that trip um the, the first um yeah we were all up and down the coast fort lauderdale um uh, virginia i'm trying to get a caribbean island we went to just off the coast but it was just a go, you couldn't do a thing wrong. And uh, a friend of mine who's, who, who shall remain nameless, he's coming to deal next week actually for a pizza. But um, he, he met this woman and uh, he came in, um, he came into the band mess and he said, yeah, fellas, I met this girl and she, she runs a hotel. We're all invited down there. So great. Boy I went down there for uh, freebies and it turns out it was a gay hotel. She was the only woman. It's a complete gay hotel, and suddenly you've got 18 young, fresh-faced Royal Marines um, descending. So we went everywhere in little groups, but boy, did they look after us. The ship moves on, and Gilly says, um, well, you know, I'm looking forward to the next port. And as we dock, um, she's waiting for him. She's driven up the coast from Virginia to uh, Fort Lauderdale to meet him. He couldn't get rid of this woman. So um, everywhere we went, and her husband, uh, sorry, not her husband, <laughs> Her father was something to do with the mafia. Gilly was looking over his shoulder. For, I've said his name right. Gilly was looking over his shoulder for, uh, for for months after that when he was trying to avoid this woman everywhere we went. But yeah, that was a that was a that was such a good trip for a young for young everyone on the boat and young bandsmen. Yes, we. I'll just tell you my little dip. I'm just adjusting the picture here, Brian, because you're wobbling your table a bit. Um, it's we're going to get stuff thrown at us. Maybe that's a bit better if I do that. Um, Stop. It's okay. It's these Zoom issues. The the modern thing that people have to worry about that isn't as bad as a bu bubonic plague. Um, so what was I going to say? Yeah. So when we went to America, one of the one of the sailors came into our mess deck. I think it was a chief. Petty officer. Though. We had we had our, you know, we had our, I would say favourites, but well, you just did. You had your favourite Matlows, and and they'd come up to your mess and share a beer or a coffee or whatever. And uh, this chief was telling us one time they pulled into Norfolk, and did you have the thing where the families come to the dockside to try to adopt a sailor or a, or a marine for the for for the time that you're there? Yeah, yeah, we went off. Went off for a weekend with uh, a, a young couple that took yeah. us to Tallah to go horse riding and, uh, and stuff. Yeah. 
yeah, Americans being the incredibly generous people that they are, um, will turn up and they'll take you and they'll host you for, for however long you want, really. But this family turned up, so it was a, a parents and a, and a daughter. And the daughter was, you know, a, let's say a young, young woman. And the chief almost immediately started to get it on with her. And the family, you know, the parents were sort of perfectly okay with it and everything. So that night they were ch sharing a room or he was sleeping in, in her bed, let's say. And he said in the middle of the night when, you know, when they were doing a business, he said he, he thought he could hear some noises in the dark. Right. So he just ignored that and he, and he carried on. But no, it's like, no, there's death. There's, there's somebody's in the room. Someone's in the So he turned and he put the light on and her parents were kneeling at the end of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why civilians very often just don't believe a word that comes out your mouth when you're a service person because stories like this to us are just second nature, aren't they? It's just stuff that happens. I can understand how to someone who hasn't been in the military would think oh, it's a lo it's a load of nonsense, but yeah. No, we have some good tales to tell. I'm just thinking back to your story, though. But perhaps they were religious; they were praying or something. Yes, I'm not. I'm not going to go there because I'll probably upset somebody. So yeah. So can we talk uh, about? I'm just looking at the your notes, Brian. So um, bum bum. Um, okay, yeah, you do mention the deal bombing at, at the end. So how did you hear of the Falklands? Um, Easter Leave. Um, I was in Stonehouse Band in Plymouth at the time. Great band to be in, Commando Forces Band. We'd all just been sent on Easter Leave. And um, we, um, yeah, I was, I was living in Torpoint just across from Plymouth, uh, thinking about taking the dog for a walk. And the phone rang and it was... Um, our band secretary said, Brian, be back in the band room tomorrow at 0700. I said, Dick, I'm on Easter leave. And Dick, who liked to talk about everything in his past, said, no, be here at 0700. Put the news on and seen some Argentine um, scrap merchants have been somewhere they, they shouldn't have been. And then that the Argentines had invaded the islands. So um, early next morning, I'm in Stonehouse Barracks, and the band, there's a big of a hubbub going on. And we kind of figured that we'd be guarding Stonehouse Barracks when all the green lid commandos, our Rocky Tufty brothers, would be going off to sort out the Argentines. So we were, we were chewing that over, and then the boss came out and stood on the podium where he'd normally conduct and said, uh, well, we're going, we're going to the Falklands. Uh, even though many of us still didn't know where they were, to be honest. Was it Scotland? Was it Wales? Was it the Outer Hebrides? So... Um, on paper, as I said, we were part of medical squadron for the, uh, the Fuller's Earth Brigade, and they were obviously gearing up to go to a war, and they were 40 people short on paper, and those, that 40 people was the band. So the colonel in charge of the, uh, in charge, I think it was logistic regiment they came under, said, well, take the band, they'll do a good job. They did, they, they did a good job when the, during the fireman strike, they've done a good job, X, Y, Z. Uh, they'll be useful people to have. Uh, don't need to bring your instruments. Don't issue them personal weapons. Just get them to Southampton um, for whatever day it was. Uh, and that was it. We were under orders to, to move out the next day. And it was our boss, uh, Captain John Ware, who said, I think we'd better take our instruments. We're going on a cruise ship, you know, keep everyone sane, especially us, people who like to play music. So uh, we lifted and shifted. Uh, and I think two days later, we were at Southampton boarding uh, the Canberra. That's, um, that's a bit of a dodgy wicket, mate, if you ask me. Because if that cruise ship sinks, you do know, you do know who doesn't get off, don't you? Well, we, yeah, you end up on deck playing while every other bugger gets off. But uh, So, yeah, it's quite something to turn up uh, at Southampton and look up at this great, huge white whale, as it was called, and uh, to go to war on a cruise ship. So that's how we, that's how me, for me, the war started. Um, call on Easter leave, summoned to the barracks, shocking news, 
get your ass to Southampton. Gosh, how did it feel going to war without a weapon? Well, not so, not so strange for us because, as I say, uh, um, we spend most of our time with our instruments in our hands. And uh, once once the ship had sailed, I wrote, we, we sailed on the on the Canberra that night, that evening, and on the dock with the parachute regiment band playing. You mentioned them earlier, mm-hmm. and uh, we thought it quite ironic that the Marines thought it worthy to take their band with them, but the paras. Uh, didn't take their bands. There was a bit of uh, a bit of a bit of uh, gentle piss taking uh, take, going there. But yeah, we, we don't have personal weapons. Uh, never never had been issued one, so it wasn't so strange. As we progressed south and we started doing training with the medical squadron, uh, we did actually have to have some weapon training off the back of the ship. And as you can imagine, the PWs, the platoon weapons people, were taking it very seriously. And there's a long tradition in the band service that when you do your annual weapons testing, um, come Friday afternoon, you want to get off as quickly as possible. So you fire as few weapons as possible, and then you get to share cleaning of them. Well, these PWs were getting everybody lined up and adjusting the sights in that time-honored fashion individually, then horrified that we were just passing the weapon over to the next person. So they were pulling the, pulling the hair out. So, yeah, so no weapons. Um, but luckily, we did take our instruments, which proved to be the, really the right decision. OK, I'm just um, I'm going to ask you a next question while you're doing that. I'm just got to edit one of your photos because I think it's in the wrong format to show on our or on, on our screen here. Um, so. Yes, just what was it? What was it like setting sail then? What's that feeling like? My gosh, we're. We joined the band. We probably didn't ever think we'd go to war because it, that's not really our forte. There was always that possibility because in times of war, the band do act in that capacity of the of first aid. Um, and lo and behold, you you are actually going to war. How how was that, Brian? Yeah, it was a, it was a funny feeling harking back to the fact that my my dad had been killed in a, in a small war at Suez. And I had his name, and there was another Brian John Short now setting off um, on another small war. But in truth, at the time, we never thought it was going to become a shooting war at, at that point. We thought the American diplomatic efforts, the IGs would see sense, and uh, it would just be a bit of a jolly. And in fact, I wasn't due to go. I was due to go to Lipston on a, a junior command course. So I'd been promoted to Lance Corporal. And... Uh, I had to go and see the boss. Look, the band are going on this jolly, as it was. I want to go. I don't want to go to CTC and miss, miss the excitement. So yeah, I was uh, I was an a, additional member and, and sent uh, to, with the band uh, instead of going to CTC. I figured the course would be cancelled anyway, which in truth it was. So it was a strange feeling setting off um, to go south with all these roughy tufty marines in Paris, and what we thought would be something of a jolly. We'd be back in three months with a suntan and a medal and a, and a couple of good dits. Turns out that wasn't quite true. Yeah, was there a, 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 a which point then, because you told me a, a pertinent story earlier, which, at which point did it all become very real? So uh, the journey south uh, was, was quite... Um, Relaxed, lots of training, lots of running around the deck. We went to Freetown in, in Syria alone to refuel. Um, then we went to Ascension Island, and we were there for, I think, 14 or 15 days. Canberra sailed every night to um, avoid the perceived submarine threat that, the, that there might have been from the Argentines. And it was about that time, at near the end of that, that um, the Belgrano was sunk by one of our submarines. And that's when uh, that's when it got quite real. But as a young man, um, they were they they were the enemy. So there was that gung ho, a wad on wad on the navy. Of course, it was just a few days later, uh, shit got really real when um, they they hit the Sheffield with an Exocet. And so it was it was um, one all sounds a bit crass, but we knew then we were in a proper shooting war, uh, and things were likely to going to get worse. Um, so we then the whole task force set off from Ascension Island, heading south uh, uh, in uh, to what we now know became a, a proper war, especially for the people ashore. 
My gosh. And you 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 were saying you actually knew one of the your first casualty was somebody that you knew. Yeah, Sergeant Andy Evans. When we were doing our medical training each year, he was a a, a Royal Marine helicopter pilot. He flew um, gazelle helicopters. And during one of our military training stints, we, um, we were loading, practicing loading um, casualties onto his gazelle helicopter at, at, at the long room at Stonehouse. And being a bit of a helicopter spotter, you know, I was asking all the all the stupid questions that people ask, and he, he realised I was interested. So during lunch, he took me for a couple of flights around Plymouth Sound and uh, answered all those questions. Let me ever go on the sticks. Um, then we, after the landings, I think it was uh, landings plus one, or maybe actually might have been on the actual day, his helicopter and another gazelle were escorting a Sea King across um, um, a headland, and both the Royal Marine uh, gazelle helicopters were shot down. And uh, the first casualty that was brought on board was, was Andy Evans. He was the first body we had to look after that was landed uh, onto, onto Canberra. And uh, what really hit me about that was um, the first helicopter, the pilot had been shot and they crashed and they were both killed. Andy Evans and his uh, co-pilot had managed to land in the water and they were swimming ashore when they were shot in the water by the Argentines. So there was no need for them to die, really. And Andy was uh, mortally wounded. His, his colleague got him to the shore and they were picked up by Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly in a helicopter. And unfortunately, though, they were, um, by, the, by the time uh, the helicopter got to um, Canberra and us, uh, Andy Evans had died and uh, the, the, his, his crewman was uninjured, but obviously emotionally badly scarred. And uh, but so, yeah, the first the first the first casualty was someone I, I knew. Jeez, I'll tell you what. Only takes one incident like that to just really make you hate your enemy, isn't it? And I'm, I'm not, folks, I'm not calling out a judgment here. I'm just saying shooting people dead in the water, it's like as bad as shooting parachutists, is it? Well, it's, maybe that's a, a different thing again, but because we actually sent one of our um, rigid raider skippers out to rescue one of their pilots, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, that, well, we well looked after them. And the, the yes. irony is, though, though, the pilot and the, the skipper are still friends to this day. Um, it, it did really change the whole attitude, my, my attitude, and uh, made a difference when I was guarding some of their prisoners later um, to, to, to them. But we went from um, D-Day in San Carlos, which was a beautiful day, and some air raids. Um, the band were full on, on camera. The band were, um, we were part of medical squadron. We were given the task of getting the casualties from the newly made helicopter decks on this cruise ship down a couple of decks to the operating theatres. That was our, our role. So the band uh, invented a ramp system and we had teams of, of, of people ready to unload the stretchers, put them on this ramp and get them down to the operating theatre which up until Andy Evans and uh, the other two dead pilots were brought on board, um, had all been just been practice. And suddenly, within, within, within minutes of the early morning, when a, a chopper comes on board almost unannounced, Rick Jolly the cat, is waving us forward, and there, there are these, um, uh, these, these people we know had, had to be transported. Um, was that how was that how, what, what age are you at the, this this time Brian uh, I'm about um, 26 25 26 yeah okay so you've got shall we say slightly more of a head and head on your shoulders as possibly a, a, an 18 year old would have done down there um, but but still, immensely shocking none, none, nonetheless yeah I've got no operational so that we used to go to Northern Ireland but only to visit the troops and play for them um, so, um, I had no operational experience other than uh, this is my first time 
in, in a shooting war. And, uh, and we'd had a lot of training in, um, on the way down about the medical, but for the first time it happens, it's a shock when you see the first dead person. And it's more of a shock if it's someone you know and, and respected and liked. So, um, yeah, it really did hit me for six and uh, made a difference to how I conducted myself. There's a, I suppose, like, um, I was very much, we were all very much musicians. And throughout that campaign, that war, I call it a war, um, we became more military men. To the point where much later in the war, we took some Welsh and Scots guards uh, we picked them up from South Georgia after the Queen Mary, as uh, Queen Elizabeth II, and Canberra took them to San Carlos. They were part of Fire Brigade, and en route, taking some of them to to the heli deck. There was a, a, I was taking a, a, a section, and they were they were rattling, and I made them jump up and down. I'm a lance corporal bandsman, and I made them uh, jump up and down and gave them a bollocking because they had coins in their mestins. That's how much of a change I'd made from being a bandy to a Marine with a military head on in those few weeks. Uh, you, and the, their corporal was horrified that, that uh, an infantry corporal was horrified that a, a Lance Corporal bandsman was giving them a bollocking. But that was the, the whole sea change over the course of over those few months. Yes, of course. You can't... You don't know when you're put in that sort of theatre who's going to flourish and and um, excel and, and who's going to shrivel and, and and underperform, do you? No. Um, on, on the other side of the coin, uh, what I would say, I, I very much knew in my own mind at that time that we were going to win this war, not because what I or the band were doing, but when you saw the professionalism and the fitness of the Marines and the Paras, you were training every day on Canberra, uh, and and we knew what they go through at Lindston. Uh, I had no doubt that whoever they were going up against, these boys were going to commit acts of gross violence against them, and they were going to win. And I have to say, the um, uh, the Paras were, were as as professional in their training and their fitness uh, at that time. For instance, off Mission Islands, uh, around Canberra Deck, it was a quarter mile. And everyone used the deck uh, for training. But uh, in particular, the teams of 40 and 4-2 commando, say, doing two miles with their base plates and their, uh, their tubes. The next day, the para mortar team was three miles. And so on and so on. Every day, there's unofficial competition to the point where I think someone had to stop them. But when you see the fitness and the commitment, uh, the paras were certainly up for the fight. And, uh, and certainly the, so were the Marines. So I knew whoever they were going up against, I didn't envy. Uh, again, there is a bit of cat badge rivalry, but uh, um, we knew we were sending uh, the best blokes ashore to do uh, the job. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at your notes. I'm trying not to get ahead of ourselves, Brian. So um, <coughs> we've covered, covered a few of these topics. Bum, bum, bum. So what what was D-Day in San Carlos like? In fact, do you want to explain what that is to our friends at home? Well, D-Day for us is the day uh, we, we landed back on the islands to kick the Argentines off. And uh, Canberra was one of the first ships in. And we went in um, at night at about one in the morning, uh, about four, four or five ships. I think it was Fearless, HMS Plymouth, um, Canberra. And uh, slipped into um, uh, a, a, a bay, a bit like Plymouth. It's a giant version of Plymouth Sand, a giant natural harbour called San Carlos Water. And we went in at night, um, uh, um, darkened ship, um, quiet routine, and the, all these ships managed to get in and, and drop anchor. And for me um, and another musician, Graham Smith, we wanted to see what all the fuss was about. So we went through the blackout screens and uh, went onto the open deck. And there was a beautiful crystal night, the outline of the islands. And uh, we thought, well, that, that's what it's about. Suddenly there's a loud crash and a flash and explosions start going off. And Graham and I run for cover. 
and we fight back through the door inside the safety of the ship uh, before Captain Byrne, uh, the Royal Navy captain in charge of Canberra, said in his public school accent, don't worry, that's our ships guarding the Argentine shore positions. So then we're not being fired at. So we went back out on the open deck and then at the bottom of the hill, there was red tracer going up the hill, which was our guys, our special forces guys ashore. And at the top of the hill was, uh, on, I think it was Fanning Head with some Argentines uh, firing down in with green tracer. And we watched this battle as the trip, more green, uh, more red tracer went up the hill and then green until eventually it stopped and our guys had um, cleared that land. Unfortunately, it was some of those guys who escaped who shot down Andy Heavens in, in his helicopter the next day. So then uh, we were told to get our heads down. Uh, there was a duty team on duty, but there was uh, nothing happened overnight. L600 in the morning, um, uh, we're up top waiting for casualties. And it was a beautiful crystal day, much like it is today here in Deal and Kent. And uh, 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 we're up on deck taking pictures and waiting for casualties that didn't arrive right away until about uh, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, when the, uh, the Argentine Air Force and Navy uh, planes started making their attacks. And uh, Captain Bourne, again, our Royal Navy captain, kept us updated but with air raid warning, white, yellow, red. And uh, all day we had uh, incoming uh, air raids happening all around the ship. Um, I don't think Canberra was actually targeted. They were going for the grey funnel lines uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but the ships next to us were um, Target HMS Plymouth, I think, got hit right next to us. Uh, and uh, it was just a, a, a crazy day. What, and in between... why, why do you think you weren't targeted? Did, did, I mean, after the Belgrano was sunk, you would have thought everything would have just been up up, up for grabs. Excuse my use of uh, the English language there, but... Do you, do you think the Argentines knew if they hit a, a hospital ship that, I mean, that didn't seem to bother them hitting the hospitals on shore? No. But, well, Canberra, Canberra wasn't a hospital ship. It had no Red Crosses. Uh, we were a troop ship. And under the Geneva Convention, you can be one or the other. You can't be both. Yeah. So we were a troop ship. And we should have been a prime target. And they made a mistake. And, uh, um, of course, how can any quote what I've read in, in over the years, uh, but apparently the uh, the next day we were targeted, but Canberra had moved. So the ship that was in our um, location was was bombed the next day. They, they were briefed to hit the ship. They'd how, realised their mistake. How, how is Canberra supposed to, other than mounting a few GPMGs up on the deck, I mean, I'm sure air defence get involved in this i just don't actually know how does camera defend itself in that situation i mean it doesn't have the sophisticated radar systems missile systems um doesn't have something like goalkeeper so a machine gun that fires god knows how many rounds a second that can shoot missiles and incoming planes out the sky how, what happens there brian uh, well, n none of the ships had goalkeeper in those days. That's pre uh, pre phalanx, I think it's called pre um, chain gun days. So um, on Canberra around the deck, we had about twenty five GPMGs lashed to the rails. Uh, we had an air defence team of the Royal Marines, and I think one of the guys got off some blowpipe missiles at some of the planes. Um, that's that um, shoulder. Um, excuse me, shoulder carried. Uh, uh, air defence weapon, and they steer it. It's wire-guided, I think, and they steer it with a thumb, so it's not accurate. Um, I think later in the uh, in the war, some of them have had some successes by shooting down Pekara uh, uh, planes. So we had these 25 machine guns all chattering away uh, and um, uh, on the upper deck, some blowpipes going off. Um, yeah, it was quite... It added really added to the cacophony of the noise. And whilst I was waiting for a casualty... Uh, helicopter to come in. I went next to a Marine who was uh, who said to me, Bandy, get me some more ammunition. And he seemed to be quite impressed that I knew how to open a tin of, of link ammunition. He was less impressed when I dropped the fucking lot on the floor into the water on the deck. So he, he binned me off fairly, fairly quickly after that. But he was trying to drive the rag. <coughs> but I tried. We've all done it. 
you try mm. dropping your, your pistol on deck in front of your in front of the, your high security detachment. <laughs> that does that doesn't go down well. But you could at least I could blame my hangover. So um, we had all these machine guns kicking off uh, on the deck. Blowpipe, a couple of blowpipes going off, and uh, the band team of, of my team. We were waiting for casualties to come in, and without any warning, a Wessex flopped literally onto the deck uh, of the midship's Canberra uh, flight deck. And uh, I ran over to see what the what, and spoke to the crewman in the back. What you know? Did he have casualties? Was he picking up stuff? And he said, "No, it's the safest place at the minute." And the pilot had just flopped down on Canberra's deck because of all the all the outgoing rounds and missiles from the the rapier on the shore of all the machine guns. Even the naffy manager on Fearless was blatting away with a, an SLR apparently. So during the air raid, uh, the uh, the pilot sometimes would get refuge anywhere they could, on shore, on land. And so we had uh, we had this Wessex just flop down. Uh, and uh, and then when he felt safe, he just flew off again. And what was it... Um, it I'm trying to grasp the... the uh, I mean, our friends at home won't ever have been in a... The vast majority won't ever have been in a situation like this. Um... Can you explain to them what, I mean, what, what are the bodies that are coming on board ship? What state are they in? What, are, are, are these people screaming? Are, are they doped up for the pain? Um, how does that affect, affect you and your, um, your fellow bandsmen? All the above, I think. Um, uh, perhaps go back to Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly as a charismatic uh, surgeon commander, he took the decision to move the hospital uh, ashore. So most of the people we got uh, had already been, had some treatment, perhaps with a big M on their forehead, meaning they'd had morphine uh, or they're already in temporary splints. Um, so most of the people uh, we come up with had already been treated in some way. Um, and then, uh, then we had people come on board in body bags I think somehow they were the most difficult to deal with because they were, well, we know, you know, you know, it, it looks like a square polythene bag, black polythene bag, but you know there's someone's father in there, there's someone's um, husband, um, and we have to get to deal with them and, and eventually do burials at sea. That was something that's... Uh, there's uh, something... Body bags serve a purpose in one respect, but, but then in another, you know, it's like one of your family dies and they carry the body out in a body bag. And it's, it, it's that kind of giving anonymity to a corpse that I don't know. I, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm just, it's. It's almost as haunting seeing the way that that life has just been covered over now. That's gone. That's history. We're, we're going to like pretend that that didn't happen. We put them in a bag. That's convenient to ship it off home. Um, almost that way that we deal with things is as, is as haunting as if maybe the body was just, you know, I know, I know. In war, it couldn't be, but if it was just laying there, and you know, in someone had cleaned it up as much as they could as a sign of respect, um, yeah, it's both those things. Yeah, seeing seeing a body and seeing a body bag evoke different emotions, but but they all meet in the same place. Yes, I think the casualties who made the most impact, apart from uh, Andy Evans were the Argentines we got on board because they sometimes had not been through the hospital system. And as well as their injuries, they were also, but they were in total shock at, at being captured and scared that we were going to kill them. Uh, they were told the British would kill them. Um, some of them were surprised to be landing on Canberra because they'd been told it had been sunk. Canberra in flames is the famous uh, Argentine newspaper headlines. Well, it, it wasn't. And uh, so they, they made the most impression because they needed herding like, like sheep. 
you know, and, and, and firmly directed below deck and in, in, into the wards. And going back to what you said about the, um, the body bags, I think for me the most emotional day of the whole war were, were the burials at sea. Um, we were on our way to South Georgia to meet with the Queen, the QE2, Queen Elizabeth II, and uh, Andy Evans and the other two pilots. Um, it was decided uh, by, senior, uh, by senior officers that we would conduct, uh, because we're still at the beginning of the operation, that we would conduct a burial at sea. So Canberra, being the ship it was, had um, large luggage doors about halfway down the side of the ship. Uh, and so on, on a certain day, uh, the, the, everyone was told this funeral was taking place. And it was packed with everyone who hadn't gone ashore. Uh, bear in mind, most of the Marines and Paris had all gone ashore by that. Uh, but there was probably two, 200 people uh, formed up, uh, four uh, Union flag um, bodies laid out, the, the, the vicar and the senior officers. And it brings me right back to something you said about the beginning. At the beginning uh, uh, two of our buglers played the most emotional last post uh, I've ever heard. It wasn't a dry eye in the house. And how they managed to play it and keep, keep control is all credit to them. Uh, and then we committed their bodies to the... Um, yeah. To the deep blue, but what a what a what a proud way for a for a sailor to go. Marines, yeah, yeah. Marines. Well, by by sailor, obviously, Marines are, are, are part of the navy. So, with their with all their yes, is it was it hard to get all over all of this? Then, I mean, I I, I guess they're in. Is the word indelible? Memories that well, until a minute ago, I said yes. Now look at me. <laughs> yeah, um, you never it never leaves you, and um, and it's not always about. I remember, um, it's just uh, just goes in that thing that crucible that part of part of those things that make you who you are. Gosh, I mean, even that in itself, I ha I think I was spuddy. Spud Ely SAS I was chatting to the other day and I was just saying that well, what's Spud what are the practicalities in war you see these pits Doug is that was that what how you dealt with it and he's like yeah temporarily you know you place your dead comrades in the ground and cover them up I believe later many were re repatriated then of course there's a there's a military graveyard on the Falklands as well I, I'm, I, I seem to remember and then of course there's the burial at sea which personally when I go fucks just you just just chuck me in the organ honestly I don't want any fanfare but that's I'll, I'll, I'll be home then or sprinkle me as I say my boy sprinkle me in the sea um, yeah I'll, I'll be all good Maybe a little fan for that. Maybe a little last post. Well, yes, I'm part of this beautiful thing called the universe, so I I can't go anywhere. So I'm I'm I'll be in the flowers and the birds and the fish and uh, the clouds. Oh, you know, after I'm gone, this is this is what I'm telling my son, Brian. You know, I want him to have a realistic understanding of. Death, I don't think we deal with it very well as a species. We certainly don't. Oh, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to. Oh, sorry, this conversation's gone at a bit of a tangent, but no, uh, I think we, we have a kind of very morbid approach to death in this country, and I prefer the celebration of life myself. Have you, have you, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I like I like uh, a good outlook on life. I mean, I, I it's describe... diff it's different when you're in the military and your mates are dying. You know, left, right, and Chelsea. It's a very sombre moment. Um, I mean, when they buried Steve, they brought his coffin into the church, and he was a dog handler up in London, right? 
first of all, he's a very popular guy. So the evening before, we all piled down the pub and one by one, the door just kept smashing open and in come a boot neck, in come another boot neck, in come, bear in mind, you know, we're spread around the globe at times. There were people coming back, you know, there were people coming back from exercises in the jungle. Door would go, here's another, and by the end of this, the, the evening, the night before, the pub was packed. Um, the next day, everybody got on coaches to go to the church and, and, uh, it was sort of because his last base was Warrior. There was a lot of um, Wrens uh, present too. Um, someone knocked me for saying this the other day, but all the Wrens were in tears, right? Most of them were right from the beginning, and I don't blame them. I, I think by the end of it, the, most of the blokes were. Um, but as they brought Steve's coffin into the church, there was a... There was a Royal Marine on one side of the church with his SA-80 upside down in that pose. Could someone put that below what that's called when you point your weapon down and you lean over it? I I, I don't know. On the other side of the door was a, a Royal Marine holding Steve's dog. It was a, a Rottweiler. And as the coffin came to the church draped in a Union flag, this poor bloody dog just started howling like arr, 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 arr. it couldn't have picked a better moment to to symbolize what steve stood for to even to a bloody dog you know if if if, if there was a dry out eye in the house then i think that all went out, went out the window and um you know very taken very seriously isn't it in the military and I'm not, I'm not saying it shouldn't be um yeah so it's all just part of the military it's just part of that military thing though brian do, do you know what i'm saying if you, if you go through that yeah what's that expression it, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger mm. and what you don't deal with makes you a bastard i think and uh, it certainly, I think it made me stronger. And I took, after the Marines, I was in the police for 12 years. And those experiences certainly helped me deal with some of the things I had to deal with in the police. It helped me get through them. And uh, I was already prepared. I don't know how you call it. But, um, I was already used to, is the wrong word, but um, I was already prepared to deal with some of those things I saw in the police. I'd already dealt with them before. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, it, it certainly if if you don't deal with them, they can sneak up and bite you in the ass. Um, yes, uh, there's, there's also the kind of in, what can you say? Like I went to on the the other side of the fence, I went to a friend's funeral, and we all just wore like board shorts and Hawaii shirts, and I gave the is it eulogy? Is that the right the the speech yeah. and um just everyone was in stitches and uh, everyone had been up all night everywhere because it was like a, a week-long party it was a completely different thing but there's there's an element to military institution that's kind of serves to function to drive drive the mili military machine um should we uh move on from death <laughs> Yeah, be more cheerful. Yes. How about divorce? divorce and no, no. Let's move on to something. <laughs> yes. So rest in peace to all our uh, all our good comrades out there. Uh, uh, you are you are never forgotten. Coming home then. I did you drop off the Argentines to Argentina? Did I did I hear that or have I misunderstood? No. Yeah. The. Um... We, we had a, quite, a, quite a few of them already on board, uh, wounded, and um, that's when that picture was taken with, uh, with, with me, with the SLR, in this, in this relatively small room. And uh, that was taken to show that we were actually looking after the prisoners uh, uh, quite well. And uh, then hostilities uh, ended, the IGs threw the towel in, and we, Canberra picked up about 4,000 of them. 
and we had a uh, hundred Welsh guards come on board uh, as guards, prison guards, and we took them all back to Argentina. So um, we went into a small port, small port called Puerto Madryn. It was an industrial port, uh, a bit like Catan. I've been in, there. Uh, have you ever been there? So Puerto, they did Puerto Madryn. Sorry to in interrupt you, Oppo, but Puerto Madryn was where the first, uh, some of the first settlers arrived down there in Patagonia. Was it just? Is it just sort of north of Patagonia? And um, they still speak Welsh there, believe it or not. There's a part uh, yeah, of Ar yeah. Argentina still speaks Welsh. It's Puerto Madryn. Ah, right. So uh, I, I, did, I did know some of them had settled there. Um, yeah, this big industrial port, and uh, we, we had um, Captain Byrne, our Royal Navy captain. We had two captains on Canberra. We had Captain Scott Masson, who was the civilian master of the ship, great bloke, and Captain Byrne, Royal Navy, who was in charge of the military. And we were going in under the Geneva uh, Red Cross Convention, which required us to have special ID cards, Special uh, uh, Red Cross people would conduct the release of the prisoners in, in a certain form. And at that time, we um, we, we only had a, uh, a hopscotch of uh, whatever that is, of weapons. Because, uh, HMS Fearless had asked for all their weapons back because hostilities had ended and uh, suddenly people had to account for where weapons were. So we were left with a couple of SLRs, a couple of pistols, and two SMGs uh, held around our necks with string. And we were the only Marines on the board on board at the time. Mm. And Captain Byrne said to the um, uh, said to the, uh, the Geneva Cross people, if that general comes up here, my Marines will open fire, talking about the Argentines. Well, we were the Marines. We were the only Marines. And we only had six weapons between us. That was a bit tongue-in-cheek. But at one point, tongue-in-cheek-wise, uh, the Band of Her Majesty's Royal Marines Commando Forces we're nearly at war with the whole of the Argentine uh, army and navy on the dock side. Notionally, I'm not just suggesting it would have come to that. Uh, the other thing we were told was don't go ashore. We, um, we start releasing the, the prisoners and they go down the, the, the gangway and they're met by an Argentine general. And uh, um, But we were passing ashore uh, under the, the, the gangway um, stretches. And just by circumstances, several of us actually ended up ashore carrying stretches about 100 yards to the Argentine uh, ambulances, which was quite a, quite, a, quite a spooky feeling amongst all these uh, former enemy. And then as I was trying to get back up, I found myself... Brian, just one, one second. I think I've got a delivery. Could you just keep telling your story? I can still hear you. You don't if, want me to go. If, no. <laughs> if you run out of dates, tell some jokes. Okay, mate. Right so back, mate. The, um, right back. the Argentine general uh, was welcoming all the troops back and uh, uh, the world's press are taking the picture. And in the background, you can see uh, myself um, stood next to the general and then being, uh, being a cheeky percussionist, drummer like I am, I took up my own camera and took a reciprocating picture up the gangway, which... Um, uh, which I used, uh, which I'm going to be using in my book, since Chris is not here. Probably a good time to tell you about the book that I've written. Like everyone and his dog who, who went to the Falklands War, uh, sooner or later they feel the need to write a book. And uh, this one uh, is going to be published this year. is called The Band That Went to War. And the reason I've chosen to write it is because each year, the, the band that went to the Falklands, we have a reunion down in Plymouth, and over the years, unfortunately, due to age and illness, uh, each year there are less and less of us. And I've realised that since the Falklands, there are now at least eight of the band um, who, who, who have passed over and have died. So this year I've decided during lockdown uh, I was going to write a book. So I've written the book and it's called uh, The Band That Went to War. And uh, it tells the story much as uh, some of the dits and stories I've told today, but it also features the picture of the Argentine general welcoming his troops back. And it also pictures uh, me beside him. And also the picture I took from the bottom of the gangway, looking up at the Argentine troops. An interesting uh, finale to this story is that on the last night before they left, 
some of the Argentine troops asked for a uh, Canberra menu cover and they all signed it with uh, thank you for looking after us uh, all in this of course but um, I've still got it and uh, it's uh, it's a nice little gift to say thanks for looking after us and taking us home and sorry we caused any trouble um, and a, a, another postscript to that is last year uh, an Argentine found a copy of this Canberra men menu and found all the Argentine soldiers who'd signed it to me. And then now they've been in touch recently, uh, wishing me well and uh, asking how I am. So, uh, yeah, that was taking the back was quite interesting, uh, exciting, and cheekily uh, got some pictures uh, posing alongside an Argentine general on the dock. Wow. And how was the journey? What was it like to arrive back in the UK I mean you've got it come you've got emotions coming from all directions haven't you you've you've got the fact that we've won you've got the fact that you're still alive when so 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 many weren't and, and so many were injured you've got the fact that you're going to see your family you've got the British um utter adulation that they had for the for the victory and and the homecoming troops Yes, put us, put us in your shoes, Brian. As soon as we left Argentina, with the, we went back to the Falklands and picked up all the commando units, the Royal Marine commando units. And they decided we weren't going to bring the, the, uh, the parachute regiment back, guys. They were going to go on the Norland and the other ships. So we were just full of Marines, the camera. Uh, and it was a party atmosphere all the way north. Now, the band on board, we were doing formal concerts, uh, for, for, for groups, but we also broke down into smaller combinations. I was in a jazz quartet with Martin Dale, Bruno Brown, and George Tate, and we played in the smaller messes for 4 2 and 40 Commando. There was also a rock band that was formed, and they played in some of the messes. So, all the way back, uh, once, once we left the Falklands, um, it, it was a party atmosphere. And uh, we got to Ascension. Of course, the weather now we're on the equator. The weather's warmer. People are sunbathing. And the only concern was, and special pipes were put out uh, over the PA system to slow down the drinking. We were going to run out of beer. And luckily, when we got to Ascension Islands, they flew on a couple of hundred kegs of beer. And for the first time ever, when, when they asked for a working party, the flight deck was full of bootnecks to move this beer down below decks. When we've been moving tons and tons of ration and compo and ammunition before, you couldn't find any other bugger but the band. But suddenly the beer arrived and Royal was there moving all these barrels. Also on Ascension, also on Ascension they flew on a, a, an entertainment team. And at one point they were going to send on Anita Harris and I can't think of his name. Oh, shut that door. What's that, that comedian? Larry Grayson. They would send on Larry Grayson and Anita Harris. The boys would have eaten him. And uh, luckily, <laughs> they didn't come. But they sent on this entertainment team of girl dancers, and musicians, singers. And they added to the, to the band's entertainment value. Uh, so we sailed on home and we uh, up channel night. is a very important night in any Royal Navy ship is when the ship's heading into Plymouth or into Portsmouth. They turned the corner by Land's End and it's your last night at sea. And the band did a fantastic um, beat retreat on the deck uh, off Land's End uh, to 2,000 Royal Marines. And they, they give us a cheer. Can you can you explain what beat, beat retreat is? Sure. During the old days when uh, war was, was uh, fought to certain rules, the medieval times, uh, at the end of the day, you would recall your troops back from the battlefield using drums, and uh, uh, this has developed into something to what the Royal Marines do, band service do, the beat retreat, which is a formal marching display with music. The buglers go out the front, do a, a drum static display, then it's finished with uh, usually sunset and last post, and the flags are lowered on Royal Navy ships. And it was a very emotional one to do off Land's End. It was great. So the next morning, we, uh, we head into uh, Canberra, heads into uh, Southampton. Um, we're followed by thousands of small boats, people lining the shore. Um, there, were, there were supposed to be 15,000 people allowed into the dock to welcome us. 
Um, but the police gave up counting at 20,000 and just let everyone in who wanted to be there. And uh, we had a fantastic uh, emotional arrival in Southampton. Took a good few hours to get everyone off the boat uh, and uh, off the ship. And uh, we all put on coaches. And for some of us, all the Plymouth ratings, the Guz ratings, we, we started the coach journey back to Plymouth. And every few hundred yards, um, people would stop the bus and throw beer on. Women would be on them. There were some young ladies who uh, showed us they weren't carrying any weapons by bearing their tops over bridges on the A303. Um, you just couldn't do a thing wrong. And we eventually got back to Plymouth after about a five-hour drive. It took us, uh, and uh, that was it. Off we went on, on eventually to, to leave and to deal with the emotions of what had just happened to us over these last three months. And how, how was that? I'm guessing it, that's, uh, that's something that's quite protracted, isn't it? Dealing, dealing with the, the aftermath of it all. At the time, you think you're fireproof, 25, 26, um, patting you on the back. Uh, the Marines, bandos now know what the band service can do. Everywhere you go, your friends and family who have missed you and want to know your, your war stories. And so you don't tend not to delve into it until you have to talk about the, the burials at sea or, or those kind of things. Or, in fact, until, until you get older, perhaps, when you want to deal with them, when you, when you those things you want to look at, examine, if they damaged you. Well, of course they damaged you. How are you going to deal with it? Um, but as a young man, you tend to think you're fireproof. It's only later in life. If, and in fact, when it came to the deal bombing, I realised I was better prepared than some of the people who, who were at the, the actual bombing at, on the day, emotionally, by having gone to the Falklands. Um, it's back to this, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I think. And there is a certain amount of that truth in that. So when and how you deal with it, I don't know. I'm, I'm still dealing with it. Of course I am. And I didn't, I wasn't sure. I wasn't doing what the commanders and the paras and the guards were doing on some of those mountains. You know, my war was on a cruise ship and was relatively easy. I say relatively, but, you know, it was relatively easy. And, uh, but it still left, it still left baggage and damage that um, I'm still dealing with. Of course I am. Let's, if, let's talk if we may <coughs> and, and feel free to say what, you want and what you don't want which I'm sure sure you will but I'm very keen on this show to highlight the veteran story uh, obviously we're in a veteran suicide epidemic at the moment it's it's probably set to get a lot worse after this last 18 months that we've all had of people having their lives just 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 imprisoned um, what what I'm getting at is, I, I say this a lot. It's one thing dealing with trauma as an adult when you have your you have the ability to compartmentalize it, to deal with it, to, to em, employ rationale. And it's a very different thing for those of us that experience trauma as as infants when we were at an age we couldn't deal with it. We didn't have the equipment. We didn't know what what this big bad thing was that was wrong um, and obviously many people that join the forces are people that are in that boat it, it produces a certain sort of character often one that wants to prove themselves if not to themselves may, maybe maybe to to certain others um, but Brian your your father was killed before you were born and I, I'd be interested to know how does that affect a young person, or or, or how did it affect you? Well, unfortunately, I, it didn't really affect me because it happened before I was born, so I knew no different. Trauma hmm. in my young life was my stepfather, who was a matlow, uh, um, an Irish guy. And he didn't like me because I wasn't his. I was the cuckoo in the nest. And uh, he hated me. Uh, and I hated him in equal measure. So my, uh, 
trauma, I can't really relate. I, I've, it was all I ever knew. I grew up without a father. And uh, eventually the Royal Marines took their place. Um, yeah, my stepfather was a bastard. And um, I, um, me and his, my stepbrother, we actually tried to kill him. We had tried to push him, we put some string across some steps and try to push him down the steps. And uh, I was aged about 14 and a half. That's when he threw me out of the house. So I had trauma as a, as a youngster, but it wasn't because my father had been killed, because I knew no different. So I can't dwell or it doesn't, it, it wasn't a wounding. Does it, the not, wounding does, later. does it not affect you in, in the capacity of, for example, going to school and everyone go, yeah, my dad's doing this. My dad's taking me to the football tomorrow. It, is that not trauma in itself? Is is that not a? The... No, because I didn't have that sort of um, childhood with my step. My, my only father figure was my stepfather, mm. as I say, was a bastard, um, and unfortunately, the um, I ended up being put into different children homes when I was a bit between twelve and, and thirteen and fourteen uh, because of circumstances he created. So I never had really a normal childhood. Upbringing. I can remember primary school, but I didn't have a father. When I did have one, I didn't like him, um, the stepfather. So, unfortunately, I, I can't really go there because it, it just it just wasn't. There was no normality in my young life, and my far my real father that, that was all, you know was never there. Um, if he'd have died when I was a few years old, I think it would have been. It, I'd have an answer for you, but it's it's very much in the negative. Uh, situation, I, I, something I never knew. The negative came later with um, with my stepfather. Got you. So let's talk about <clears throat> the tragedy that was the Deal bombing. Let me just get a picture up for for folks watching. Uh, oh, one second. Right. Just turn my microphone off while I sneeze and cough. Um, where are we here? Let's just. So yeah, I'm just bringing up a picture here of the barracks in Deal. I was a uh, I was on patrol in Belfast, and I remember a bus full of Catholic school children went past, <coughs> and. I don't know if it's part of the whole kind of upbringing over there that bands are a big thing. Um, you you can enlighten us more more, more to this, Brian. Bands are certainly big for the Orange Order, aren't they? And their marching parades and all this sort of stuff. But anyway, the point I'm getting to is this bus went past and the kids did a remarkable job of drumming on the floor of the bus with their feet. And of course they were... Uh, they were having a go at us because they just heard about the deal bombing. So they were taking a piss out of us, basically. Um, so, yes, over, over to you. What what happened? Uh, so I was, uh, ought to explain, deal barracks is split in, was split into four with public roads, your east, north, south barracks and the infirmary with public roads um, split, dividing them. Uh, we had civilian guards by that point. Um, uh, and talk about paying, you know, pay, pay peanuts, get monkeys. Nice chaps, but uh, they weren't armed and they weren't particularly diligent. I'm not blaming them for the deal bombing. Uh, but we felt, as the School of Music, because the, uh, the commando training had moved from that point, we felt the School of Music, to be honest, we probably weren't a target, uh, which was rather naive. Uh, and then on... Uh, the 22nd of September, 1989, um, at 8.20 in the morning, um, the IRA had got in and planted a bomb in the band room. And a couple of dozen guys were in there getting changed. And it went off and brought the most of the building down, uh, killing, killing quite a few and trapping others. Um, I was cycling down the hill to work at the time and... Uh, I got to the corner of the road and I saw one of the, the guy who used to teach uh, uh, violin, George Simpson, was stood there covered in dust saying there's been a gas explosion. And I cycled up to the barracks and dust was still settling uh, at, at this point. 
and uh, people were scrabbling through the rubble. And there was a smell, and uh, it, was, it was obviously explosives. I say obviously, and maybe, maybe I'm mixing up memories there, but I'm sure at the time it wasn't gas. And um, f- the fire service was starting to arrive, the police were starting to arrive, uh, bodies were starting to be pulled out of the rubble, people, people I knew. Uh, and uh, we started to dig amongst the rubble for um, for survivors. And the fire the fire chief, uh, once he as the incident commander, as they're called, uh, blew his whistle and got everyone to be quiet. Because one of the things that happens uh, in those circumstances, people buried um, avalanche, like I think, you need to listen for survivors. And after he'd stop every two or three minutes to listen for survivors, and then carry on digging. And the small team I was with, uh, we were digging away, and somebody found a, a shoe. But as he pulled the shoe out, uh, there was still a foot in the shoe, but it wasn't attached to anyone. So um, I took the, 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 the shoe and the foot and put it in a blanket. And I just think that was one of those circumstances that I'd been better prepared for than some of the others. Uh, then, um, unfortunately, because it, the, the incident was ongoing, uh, we knew we had about eight or nine dead at that point. Um, one of the um, silences was called for, for, so we could listen for survivors. And there were news helicopters hovering overhead, deafening, not deafening, but you know, masking the silence. Uh, and I got very angry at that. So I managed to get to a phone in phone RAF Manson and got them to make contact with the helicopters and tell them to fuck off, basically. Um, and by the end of the day, we had 10 dead. Uh, overnight, we had another one die, and there were dozens injured. Um, a friend of mine uh, luckily survived. He was blown out of the room and halfway through a window, but was trapped by his legs. And so um, he had to be dug out, not by us, by um, but by the first, the first people on the, on the scene. And some of the first people on the scene were actually the, the junior musicians who had not long joined, and we're practicing on the parade ground, marching up and down, playing a song, uh, playing a, a march. The bomb went off. Uh, and they were some of the first people in their first months of their military career who were on scene dealing with the, the immediate aftermath of the bombing. So it ripped the heart out of the barracks. It ripped the heart physically out of the buildings. It ripped the heart out of the band service. And in a small town like Deal, it ripped the heart out of the town as well. Gosh. And I think an emotional point for everyone, as if this isn't emotional enough, was when the the band marched through deal and, and didn't they leave spaces in the ranks for those those that, that were dead? Yeah, I actually, um, I marched in the parade, but I was just with the senior NCO instructors. But in the um, in the bar afterwards, I said to Graham Harvey, who was the RSM, he was uh, an RSM, but he was a, a warrant officer band, a bandmaster. And I broke down then, because I said we shouldn't have left the holes, just because it showed the IRA what they'd achieved. Um, I get why we did, and it wasn't my decision, but to me, it was a physical showing of what of their success, if I say that in bunny ears, you know, um, what they'd achieved. I, uh, but, um, yeah, there's no right or wrong answer to that, just personally. And that's what really got to me. And that's, I broke down in the sergeant's mess when I was trying to explain that to him. But, um, yeah, it was uh, a, a, a bad day. <laughs> Lost people since who, who have not uh, been attributed to the bombing, but um, I know we've lost people since who, who have died as an indirect uh, consequence of that bombing, emotionally, um, or, 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 or got involved um, with the. Dif- it was dif- dif- addictions. It was particularly harsh. As obviously, all, all all incidents like this are harsh, but it, the the mainly teenagers, many of whom had only just joined the unit, none of whom were commandos. Obviously, they were in the band, so they weren't... It wasn't as if they were a, 
a military target. There was, I heard talk, I don't know how accurate this is, that they were having a disco there, which wasn't particularly well securityed, um, can we say, or guarded because of this civilian security firm, and that girls were coming in, just a quick flash of their handbag, and then they were allowed in. I think that, that's not true. That's a, that is one of those urban myths. Um, there were discos. Um, they were or weren't badly attended. But the team that did this, uh, we know the house they stayed at. Well, they know the names of the members. They know the guy who climbed over the wall and placed the bomb in the band room. Um, um, so it's it's no great secret, you know, the route, the route in and out. I mean, I know this from my time in the Marines and in the police. They know who these people are. And uh, they know the house where they stayed. Forensically, it was, it was, it was, you know, they were they were found. Um, they weren't particularly good at hiding hiding themselves at post event. There was lots of forensic evidence, but um, for whatever reason, they've never been brought to justice. Yeah, no one was ever even arrested, which is bizarre. Well, I think the Good Friday Agreement and all that kind of political maneuvering has, has meant they'll go scot-free. But certainly their names are known. They're, and uh, the actual bombers, the guy who went over the war, it was two, two men and a female rented this house uh, ostensibly to go fishing, which Dill was known for. But um, no, they were, it, was, it was a road that, and, that went alongside the barracks and it was no problem for anyone to get over, over the wall. Uh, the, the, practically the first building they would have come to would have been the band room. And uh, there were no roving patrols at the time, civilians on the gates. Uh, and uh, it was just unfortunate, well, more than unfortunate, but uh, our boss at the time, as uh, Colonel Dixon, um, his career suffered um, as a result, although it was not his fault. The, the, the <clears throat> excuse me, the barrack security was, was not down to him. It was the MAD who would be replaced Marines with um, civilians. And the adjutant at the time was uh, Lieutenant Keith Mills, who was famous for his work in uh, his, his, his small war in South Georgia. And I think they were both tainted career-wise by the bombing, although, you know, it really wasn't their fault. Mm. Um, so. so, Brian, um, when you're not writing books, I'm going to bring your book up on the screen again. Um, what do you do with your days? If you ask my wife, very little. But um, during lockdown, I um, uh, obviously I took the time to write this book. Hold on. I'm running out of battery, even though I've got it plugged in. I'm down to 10%. Um, yeah, I've retired. I, uh, I did 12 years in the police afterwards, uh, so I've got a fairly decent pension because I transferred my Royal Marine time into police time. Um, I do a bit of music. Um, during lockdown, I've written this book. Uh, I did write another book called When God Came Back, a science fiction extravaganza, 120,000 words. And I don't know 120,000 words, so I had to use some of them over and over again. But um, by all accounts, it's, that book is uh, not very good. So yeah, I was going uh, to say, there's, there'll be one of your two books that I'll be reading. I, I'm, I'm afraid, Brian, it won't be that one. No disrespect to you. It's just I, I, I'm not a massive I write fiction, but I'm not a massive fiction. It's got to, it's got to be right for me, and I'm not really. I've never I've never really liked sci-fi for some reason. I, I uh -huh. think it's because from a young age, I've always thought bloody hell, there's so much stuff in the world that's real, that's fascinating. Why why do people from the age of being children want to fictionalize some? something that's out of this world <laughs> when there's enough on the planet that's 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 real to focus on shall we say well th that book was a friend of mine we were talking about animal welfare and animal cruelty and she said well what happens when god comes back and finds what we've done now i'm not religious but i said that's a great title for a book when god came back so it's part science fiction it's part it's not religious, but it does also look at some of the animal, the way we treat animals. But anyway, the premise was good. The execution wasn't so great. And I, I didn't spend the money having it edited. 
So uh, there are so many typos that, um, and I self-published on Amazon. But um, yeah, I, I, it's the premise is so good it deserves, but uh, it deserves a, a sequel. Uh, but it'd be better written. But this book, I've, I've spent a lot of time editing. Of course, it's factual. It's done from my diaries uh, and other people's accounts. It's called um, The Band That Went to War. And uh, it's got uh, a lot of original pictures in it, including myself posing with the Argentine general in Porto Madryn. And uh, I've spent a lot of time editing and correcting all the typos. So I am uh, I'm moderately confident that this is a much better um, book. And Pen and Sword have done a great job on the uh, jacket cover, the cover of the book, which uh, I've, I've, I think you may have a copy of. I'm very pleased with that. And it should be out in the summer, late summer. Uh, uh, yes, I'm just looking to see if it's listed yet, but I don't think it's up yet, so we can't put a link 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 for it below. But when it does come on the market, let me know, and I'll put a link under underneath our video. Thanks, Chris. Brian, I have to say, it's been an absolutely fascinating chat. Um, friends at home, lots of difficult subjects to talk about. Um, but I think it's just good to talk and we try to do our best here on the channel to, you know, cover issues that can sometimes be controversial, can sometimes just be bloody harsh to talk about. So, um, yeah, so I hope, I hope, <laughs> hope everybody gets that. Brian, you seem remarkably, um, well at well adjusted royal if i may say so well you you'd be one of my friends that would say that um you're not as angry as me are you no no i've uh i've dealt with a lot of my issues luckily uh and even today talking about it, it's quite cathartic to realize that actually i've still got a few issues i need to tease out and uh um i th one of the good things is i play drums so if if there's any fucker I want to take it out on, I can go and give it 10 bells on the drum kit. And uh, that gives me a good emotional and physical outlet and still. So music, music I'd say, is a, is a, has been a good therapy for me over the years. Humour as well. Uh, um, I think I'm a bit of a smart ass and I write uh, pantomimes and stuff. So uh, yeah, I've got several outlets for my, shall we say, creative duties. And with it goes a lot of my angst and anger. Uh, Unless, of course, you're one of those Indian scammers who phones me up like they did yesterday and they get both barrels. But uh, so, 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 yeah, I'm touch wood, I'm dealing with it and living life as best I can. Good. Excellent. Well, Oppo, thank you so much again. Uh, wish you all the best with, with your future and, and, and obviously also your book, uh, which, as I say, I do look forward to reading. To our friends at home, massive love to you all. There we go. Look, you get a subscribe up on the screen. Technology is on our side today. So if you could please do that, like and subscribe. Also, probably should have said this at the beginning. Uh, friends, if we can get some support for the Patreon. Uh, we're telling stories on this channel that we, we don't really want lost to history. We want to preserve these so the the next generation can learn by them and, and, and hopefully iron out, see the, um, maybe iron out some of this generation's uh, mistakes, can I say. Um, so yeah, if you could like and subscribe and support the Patreon, it's one ninety nine a month. You get all my books for free um, in ebook form. You get to come as VIPs to my annual talk. So yes, that's it. I'm going to be quiet. See you all soon. Credits. <laughs>